I'm just pausing to absorb where we are today. For me, this is quite something special to be at Oxford University. I never made it here. I went to Loughborough University. So understand my emotions as I'm here today amongst greatness. Potential greatness, perhaps, is, is a better phrase. You're one of the finest universities in the world. There's no doubt about that. Look around you. There are future leaders here, influencers, decision makers in a variety of fields, industry, academia, financial services, the military, and yes, politicians as well. I wonder where you're going to end up one day. <laughs> Look around you. You are the future. One of you could very well be a prime minister. Think about that. Somebody in this room is very likely to be a prime minister. And the speed in which we're getting through them, that might be sooner <laughs> than you think. <laughs> but I say to you, in all seriousness, there's an expectation that you will succeed, a sense of duty, that your country needs you as part of the next generation of leaders. I say this because this is Oxford. You have a reputation. You stand on the shoulders of generations before you who have taken that same journey. This means the wider world is already paying attention to what you collectively think and say. And that leads me nicely to the motion today. This house would not fight for king and country because given what happened 90 years ago, almost to the day, we know that this original motion was debated and indeed won. But if I may, to the proposers so far, who perhaps glossed over the actual title of this uh, motion, hoping that you might not look at the very simple words that were there. This house would not fight for king or country. There's no asterisk that says, but unless things get really difficult, then yes, we would. <laughs> it's yes, we would not fight for king or country. Not uh, if there's an invasion that takes place or if the Falklands, is. these are circumstances that I can understand. No, it's very, very clear. You are voting on a very straightforward motion here today. You would not fight for king or country. It's the same motion as before. The only reason why it's not the same words is because the president will confirm you're not allowed to use the same words and repeat the same motion. They sometimes have to change. But the history of this debate, it's exactly the same emotion that we're dealing with, exactly the same history, exactly the same subject today as to whether it's important to be fighting for your king and country or not. So I am pleased to stand to oppose this motion. And give, given the title's debate, it's loaded with history, it really is a privilege to contest it. Of all the debates that I'd wanted to participate in at this wonderful place, this is the one that I'm glad I'm here to discuss. This motion could be better phrased. This House would not support a fight to defend freedom, democracy, and the rule of law, either at home or abroad. That would be a better title that we could all then agree with. Because with that, past myths are removed as the idea that fighting for a country requires a Faustian bargain for, of a chivalric obedience to some outdated feudal or aristocracy, as was pointed out by the proposers. No, my argument tonight would be that Firstly, king and country is shorthand for the very values, that very values that are in danger today, and the very international order that we helped to create. And we are designed, I think, geared in our DNA to protect that is now in crisis. And then also, what our contribution is to defending those values and that order and that requires, I'm afraid, a will to fight. Not the entire nation, as the president said, not even a section of it, 
but a fit-for-purpose professional armed forces in lockstep with our allies. And I was proud to be one of those people. I signed up as a regular. I continue on as a, as a reservist today. So let me first clarify what king and country is. Let's not be distracted by the semantics of this title. It's nothing to do with the monarchy. If you want to debate about republicanism, as we may get in a few minutes' time, I welcome that. But that's not for today. King and country, in shorthand, is about the British state. The symbol of monarch represents the entire state and its shared history. The British state is a system forged with the aim of protecting democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. Therefore, fighting for the British state is at best a fight to promote and to defend those values and that state from those who threaten both them and indeed it. This debate is not also about the obligation for an individual to fight. There is no mass conscription at the moment. You volunteer to serve king and country. It's also not about the decision-making of individual governments relating to specific campaigns, such as Iraq or indeed Afghanistan. That's more related to the quality of government decision-making, which again would be an interesting debate, but is not for, the day, for today. For the record, I was against the invasion of 2003. And if you don't like the MPs that make the decisions, then stand and replace us, because that's what democracy is all about. So often I hear this, that, oh, it's them up there in Westminster, don't understand what's going on. They up there, me, George Galloway, when he served, are you. You're, we are taken from the gene pool of society. If you don't like us, we reflect you. So stand up, serve, get elected. And I bet some of you will do exactly that. And good on you. Because that's where the decisions become hard. And yes, sometimes you get it wrong. And Iraq was definitely one of those occasions. On Afghanistan. I visited that country 10 times after I invaded, after the invasion. I lost my brother in the Bali bombing, killed by terrorists, killed by Al-Qaeda affiliates. So I was interested to see what we were doing in Afghanistan to make that place better. Boy, did we get it wrong, imposing Western values on Afghanistan. They weren't ready for it. That's where we went wrong. But that doesn't mean to say you don't serve a king and country just because the politicians didn't understand what was required in Afghanistan. And yes, departing Afghanistan has left it in a very dire case indeed. So it's worth putting that debate 90 years ago into context as well. This was February 1933. Imagine that period of time. 20-year-olds sitting, I suspect, in the very seats that you are today would have been born in 1913, growing up as a child during the war and in its aftermath, witnessing older brothers, fathers, uncles, many of them going off to fight, many of them not able to return. That was the height of the push for disarmament and universal support for the League of Nations. And of course, at that point, there was no threat of king of country, it was evident there, because we had the mighty Treaty of Locarno, this big signing of all the old friends and foes that came together in London, committing to peace. Why would you want to have to commit to king and country anymore when peace was now prevailing? So is it any surprise that there was little, little appetite at that time to support king and country? Ladies and gentlemen, war is hell. And the war in the trenches had been the most hellish ever. Barbaric suffering and squalor, barely redeemed by the heroism and comradeship that was sometimes illustrated in some of those poems that we've heard. This was the image of the war in the 1930s. No wonder your predecessors decided to vote to support this motion. But as I said, the nation took uh, interest at that point in that debate way beyond what was going on here. There were press following what was happening there. So it wasn't just the nation that was listening, but it was also Adolf Hitler has been mentioned by the president at the opening, with Churchill later claiming it had influenced Hitler's own calculations on Britain's will to fight. And of course, in the months that followed, in February, 
Hitler gave that secret speech to his military leaders outlining his plans to rearm Germany and to seek greater Lebensraum in Eastern Europe. The Reichstag fire was used as an example or as a, an excuse to get rid of the communists and, of course, to get rid of so many civil liberties. The first concentration camp just came days after Dachau was built, days after that debate took place. And then the Gestapo was established a month later as well. And then finally, Churchill, in August of that very same year, in 1933, gave that speech that said, there's a danger in Germany, they're rearming, and we should do something about it. The war was beginning to unravel, but thankfully, when the call came to serve king and country, as the president mentioned earlier, 2,600 students from Oxford, out of 3,000 eligible, answered that call to defeat fascism and preserve freedom. The circumstances that provoked that 1933 vote have now changed. Trust is a collective security that protects states and their values. This is now starting to break down. There was a direct threat at that point as there is today. It is now necessary to fight for king and country. And after the war, of course, we have relative peace. Thanks to the establishment of a new uh, set of global uh, values and rules that Britain was involved in crafting. The ideolo ideological threat then came from Russia, as did the start of this new Cold War, demanding that we stayed on our toes. Those serving queen and country at that time kept us safe as a deterrent. Now, for me, this was my childhood. I grew up in Vienna during the Cold War with the Iron Curtain only 30 miles from where I lived very conscious that that was the world, a very dangerous world indeed. Who was to know that then it all were to collapse with the Berlin Wall in 1989? Two years later, the Soviet Union fell and the Cold War was not only over, the West had triumphed. Now, I never imagined that this victory of freedom would be so short-lived because 30 years on, after that relative peace of hubris and complacency has taken over, that's drove it, driven the West to overextend and under-resource. As we've heard today, our armed forces are not up to par to deal with the threats that are coming over the horizon. And Afghanistan and Iraq were bridges too far, demanding once-in-a-lifetime tenacity and resilience, which states proved unwilling to provide. So to sum up where, th where things are, the Munich Security Conference, this big gathering of internationalists, actually labeled last year coined the phrase Westlessness, that the West has lost sight of what we stand for, what we believe in, what we are willing to defend. And now that we see Putin has indeed invaded Ukraine. Now, he may not have expected Ukraine to stay and fight as they've done, but he did gamble correctly on NATO, I'm afraid, benching in itself. And President Zelensky is absolutely right to visit the UK and ask for more help. So I say to you in conclusion, Hard power matters. It works every day in deterring aggressors from challenging our own interests. And I offer you a grave warning as we head towards another Cold War. We've entered a new era of insecurity as our rules-based order is being tested and exploited not by one, but by two regimes, by Russia and by China. Not the people of Russia and China, but the regimes, the elites in those countries. And on current trajectory, our world could splinter into two competing spheres. Is this the time, really, to signal that we intend to drop our guard? We've earned our seat on the UN Security Council. We need to keep it, and that requires us to keep our hard power. So as our global order gradually fragments, as insecurity once again is on the rise, as authoritarian states begin to flex their, flex their muscles, and as another Cold War begins, Britain has a duty to show leadership, to rekindle that smart statecraft that served us well in the past and play its influential role on the international stage. So to those here today that intend to serve king and country, I salute you. As a reservist, I stand proudly with you. To those who are not going to serve, I humbly say to you, be grateful that there are some willing to volunteer and step forward. They serve king and country, and they do so to defend you, your freedoms, and your way of life. But we can all 
stand united today in defeating this motion tonight. Thank you.